Global and national economic situation is stagnant at best. Our central government is demanding, demanding more scale and efficiency. We are challenged by some major demographic trends. Environmental protection and quality is top of mind for many people, and public expectations of councils is increasing, or are increasing. First, let's look at the economic environment, which is driving a number of demands and behaviours that are putting pressure on local government. Last year, I suspect many of us breathed a sigh of relief at what appeared to be the beginning, uh, the world beginning to take some faltering steps out of the global financial crisis, but as we now know, it was not to be. Um, that massive political unrest in the Middle East and in North Africa has continued. Many economies have not demonstrated any ability or indeed in some cases willingness to manage their debt crises. Our older trading partners are caught up in this t turmoil and with rare exceptions are in fragile situations. In New Zealand, the repercussions of the GFC and of the collapse of local investment companies in particular, taking with them the retirement savings of a large group of people, have continued to ripple through the community. The Christchurch earthquakes have added to our woes. Our GDP per capita is still below what it was in 2005. NZIAR refers to the lost time index. They say we've lost seven years in the current recession through unemployment rate, real wages, house prices, stock returns and consumption per capita. Fundamental changes will be required to catch up. The government tells us we will be in surplus by 2015-16. By we, they mean the government's books, not New Zealand. As a country, the downward trend of the gap between export revenues and import costs continues. Our trade deficit for the year to May increased by 248 million to 800, uh, just over 800 million. And again, reversing such trends, and I think that's the major one we should focus on, um, will require a way, a change in the way the private sector, the government, and councils do their business. A recent Burl report highlighted caution in recent buoyant growth figures. Commentators and government have reported national D GDP or activity growth over the last 12 months in the range of 1 to 2 per cent, which we should note is lower than the margin of error. Perhaps a truer reflection of what's going on are indicators such as consumer spending, the employment rate, business confidence and commercial building consents in some larger centres. All of these influences will be felt by local government. The current graphic example is the Kaipara District Council's wastewater treatment plant, designed, I understand, for a large community of Auckland batch owners who simply never built those holiday houses because of the economic downturn. Local government is in many ways on the receiving end of economic trends, but how it responds can make a big difference locally. Mike's just talked about in detail and very helpfully about debt, uh, rates and debt, very useful data. Fiscal responses of local government will be important, but this is not just about rates, though clearly with the rising population of retirees on fixed incomes, affordability will continue, will grow into a bigger issue, and I'll talk a bit about that later. What is also important is leadership in pulling the region together and identifying the needs and solutions, the ability to prioritise and the presence of spatial planning to layer social trends with future infrastructure and service demands. These are all areas where the new Auckland has stolen a march on the rest of the country in responding to the economic situation. The physical environment offers equally uncertain outlook. Yesterday in the media, the breakup of the Arctic ice shelf was reported. The debate on whether climate change is human-induced or a natural occurrence matters for government governments who need to decide if they're embracing mitigation or adaptation, or both. Mitigation, of course, will only be successful if it's undertaken on a wide scale globally. Local government is more likely to be at the adaptation end of the, of the spectrum. And um, because of its na that's because, obviously, of its narrow sphere of inf influence. However, even then, the scale and cross-boundary and cross boundary nature of many of the impacts of climate change will make the action of individual councils inefficient and unaffordable. So scale will be increasingly important in this area. Despite this challenge, local government has two characteristics that make it a logical choice to lead the effort to respond to climate change. First of all, they are close to their communities and have multiple channels of communication with them. And they are close to where the action will be required, since climate change affects 
will be felt at local levels ranging from pan-regional down to the town, suburb and neighbourhood scale. Associated with climate change is sea level rise and impacts on coastal systems, including increased coastal erosion. And again, if you read the Don Post this morning, you will have seen one of our local councils' good and brave response to that. Higher storm, storm surge flooding, inhibition of primary production processes, more extensive coast, coastal inundation, changes in surface water quality and groundwater characteristics, increased loss of property um, and coastal habitats, Increased, increased flood risk and potential loss of life, loss of non-monetary cultural resources and values, impacts on agriculture and aquaculture through decline in the soil and water quality, etc., and perhaps loss of tourism, recreation and transport facilities. There is also the question of community resilience. Everywhere there is a growing realisation that following any kind of natural disaster in particular rather than long-term trend, the locals may well be on their own for a period and that neighbourhoods need to understand this. These are all areas of local government concern. Unfortunately, the uh, challenges in both the economic and physical environments um, uh, have some issues because New Zealand has a legacy of ageing infrastructure. Um, Mike has just told us that the jury is out on whether um, regulatory standards have contribute to, to, contributed to increased costs. I believe that they have, and in particular for smaller TAs, and I certainly know um, for a fact around the region that there are a lot of trade-offs going in this area, and some of them include... Um, trade-offs or pushing for trade-offs with the regulators, which of course could be their colleagues in regional councils, about the standards that need to be met. Um, but apart from those higher standards, particularly for water, we do require world-class infrastructure to support the scale of economic growth required to reduce debt, improve public services and get on with that um, tradable economy. We also, we are um, also likely to have to move or enhance much of our coastal infrastructure as a result of environmental changes. In total, councils own about a just over $100 billion worth of assets, largely infrastructure. At a national level, um, expenditure by councils on transport roading in the three waters is about 40% of their spend. But this is not evenly spread, with many smaller councils spending double that percentage on infrastructure-related activity. All of these issues require long-term strategic vision embedded into planning, especially what is now called spatial planning, including longer-term longer planning horizons, and I was interested to hear the question about 30 years. That in itself requires scale, and the delivery requires resource. If that's depressing, then a word about demographic trends will um, increase your depression. Here there are two relevant trends to consider, population growth or decline across New Zealand and the impacts of ageing population. These are not evenly distributed across the country. Any future population growth will be dominated by larger centres such as Auckland, um, Waikato and Bay of Plenty, Wellington and Christchurch. Business, investment, infrastructure demand, government services will follow such growth areas. Conversely, 27% of TAs have already had negative growth between 1991 and 2011 and will continue that depopulation trend. Local government activity in these areas could be described as maintenance function rather than planning for growth. We've all heard about the ageing population, most of us probably part of it, I certainly am. The distribution graph of age groupings with children at the bottom and the elderly at the top used to look like a triangle, but is now rapidly changing shape, with fewer pe people under 15 and far more over 65. This means that for many areas there will be labour market, fewer, um, there will be fewer entrants than exits into and from the, the, the labour market, by 2021, 84% of TAs will be faced with this situation. So pressure on labour and skill supply will limit a, a region's ability to grow. The micro impact is pretty clear. For many councils, access to skills in areas such as engineers, uh, environment planners, senior accountants maybe, is already prov pr proving difficult. 
fulfilling the quality service delivery expectations of citizens will be dependent on the quality of staff. Many smaller councils will not be able to afford to duplicate specialist business units and will need to share or merge such expertise for the benefit of their constituents in the wider region. On the macro side, only 15% of districts will have more elderly than children. Sorry, have. By 2031, that number will be um, 90%. A lot of people, many of whom, as I mentioned earlier, may be on fixed incomes, but will have high expectations of needs. Something has to change if we are to plan for and manage the implications of such major shifts in a relatively short time. There are new challenges um, that we are facing. They're new to us because we've never had an ageing population before and the solutions won't be found in our history. As well as economic, environmental and de demographic changes, access to technology and societal trends has led to the emergence of what is being called new democracy. Everyday decisions are increasingly being driven um, by citizens through online services, for example, and that means that 24-7 access and expectations of rapid responses will need to be met. The explosion of social media use means that ideas spread like wildfire and politicians and councils can become engulfed in a rage of public opinion that they simply didn't see coming. It also means that very little can be hidden. For councils, uh, this means that interaction with citizens is likely to become more people-led than politically-led, perhaps less authoritarian than local government has been historically. This will require completely new paradigms about citizen engagement and, in my view, must question the need for, for New Zealand to have so many hierarchical structures for such a small population. The whole paradigm of how government, local government operates really has to change. This is the backdrop against which the government is proposing a massive amount of change to the local government legislative framework. Some in the local government sector are saying that no change is needed, and to me this is a surprise. No pun intended, Re Christchurch, but we are in the midst of enormous seismic shifts in our economic, physical and social environment. It's clear there are issues, trends and circumstances in local government that are getting in the way of optimal performance by NZ Inc., and we don't have the luxury of believing that business as usual is acceptable. The government's legislative reforms are in two major areas, the Local Government Act and the Resource Management Act, and are part of a broader programme of building a more productive, competitive economy and better public services. There are multiple work streams on the go, and some of you here are, will know more about them than me, and, but I guess the question is whether or not these can ultimately be integrated into a sensible and complementary package that will galvanise local government delivery, or if they are just too fragmented for this to occur. Like many in the sector, I've thought about this a lot. Yes, there could have been more alignment of issues and perhaps fewer initiatives overall, and certainly timing of all the work streams is not optimal. But the whole is far too big for one project, and in my view would simply have found it. The key to success will be the ability of the government uh, to take the results of one work stream and use them to inform another, then build a package that makes sense, doesn't create even more bureaucracy or have unintended consequences. The area that's received um, probably most public attention is the Better Local Government Reform Programme aimed at providing more clarity around the role of councils, stronger governance, improved efficiency and more responsible financial management. The Local Government Amendment legislation currently before a select committee is intended to refocus the purpose, uh, introduce fiscal responsibility requirements, strengthen council governance provisions, provide government with intervention processes and streamline reorganisation procedures. My own view, personal view, is that refocusing the purpose of local government is not going to make much difference. Apart from running a lotto shop, I haven't heard either the Prime Minister or any other minister say that anything any council does would not be able to be done under the new regime, provided that it has community benefit and presumably that the council has consulted and the community agreed. Now, some people are saying under legal advice that the change will open councils up to litigation from ratepayers on the grounds that a particular service or initiative may be ultra vires. 
I've also seen a legal opinion to the contrary, and I know you're going to hear from other lawyers today, from lawyers today who may have a disagreement on this issue, so it'll be interesting that I've concluded that the amendment is driven um, by politics and that those other parts of the bill are probably more important. Moving on, the concept of fiscal responsibility requirements is good, uh, but care is needed that problems don't arise through the government's execution of this policy area. Some of the earlier rhetoric around this initiative, as has just been pointed out, um, proposed tying rates to rises in the CPI. Rates capping is a completely insane idea if New Zealand wants to catch up with its infrastructure deficit. No one can argue against councils being fiscally responsible and no one can argue that all councils have always been fiscally responsible. But the best way of approaching this might be for councils to more actively benchmark best practice and introduce a degree of self-regulation, i.e. learning from one another and actively seeking assistance when things look as though they are going awry. The idea of a hard cap for rates is not being floated so much these days, and hopefully local and central government will be able to agree on a sensible approach and this is going to be a matter of regulation in the end rather than having any formula written into the legislation. The government also proposes in the bill to strengthen council governance provisions by giving mayors similar powers to that now um, enjoyed by the mayor of the New Auckland. I don't think this is a big deal. In most cases there will be agreement between the mayor and the council regarding things such as positions of responsibility and whatever the legal um, requirement, the Mayor still needs a collaborative council to get policy passed. A further provision of the Bill gives the Minister a range of different interventions if something is wrong in a council. These steps are not available under the current regime and in that sense are a useful early alternative to the so-called nuclear option. The one area where this might be improved, however, is in utilising local government itself as the first port of call when a council is in trouble. This has happened informally previously and I believe would be a useful way of addressing issues before they escalate to become totally unmanageable. However, it would require local government entities to be prepared to do this and to accept peer support, which in most cases would also, cases would also involve peer criticism. If local government is not prepared to demonstrate that it can act in this way, then there is no reason why the minister or government should have confidence in the sector by formally involving it, so it's really up to us. The last and possibly uh, most important of the bill's major provisions relate to streamlining local government reorganisations. It's commonly accepted that under the current law, a local government reorganisation proposal is simply not possible. Um, which I guess is why the government, in fact two governments of different hues, sought to avoid it by first creating the Royal Commission on Auckland, then when the report was in introducing spe special legislation to set up the new city. The bill effectively removes the power of veto that small councils currently hold over their whole region. It removes the necessity for a compulsory referendum and requires it only after a petition signed by 10% of the el eligible voters from all the authorities concerned. If a referendum is held, it needs to be passed by a majority of those voters voting across all the affected territories rather than by each of the council areas concerned. It also widens the definition of community leadership in, um, in terms of who may make a proposal or support a proposal, proposal to the Commission, and I think that's pretty important. It's been an issue of debate in this region where some mayors have contended that the only people in a position to make those decisions or proposals are elected representatives. These are the main provisions, but there are other machinery changes as well. I'm sure you're aware of this and I won't go through them. I think, however, that the big area of omission is that the bill does not provide for any model other than what is currently available, either a single unitary council on the one hand or a regional council with TAs on the other. This seems very strange given that all the government rhetoric and in fact the whole thrust of the reforms has been about pr promoting efficiency and scale. Our council's submission was heard by the select committee last week and I told them that no change was likely in Wellington and probably I would think elsewhere in New Zealand unless there is some amendment providing for the establishment of, of what is becoming, becoming known as the two-tier unitary model. 
Basically, this is something similar to Auckland, providing for local community councils delivering local, locally focused services and leadership, with a regional unitary council delivering in areas such as infrastructure, planning and, lead, regional, and regional leadership. The unitary council would also be the single rating authority and of course would provide the integrated back office for the whole region. In my view, this omission could be a showstopper for any change in local government structure. It's abundantly clear in our region that there is very little appetite for a monolithic centralised council, and I cannot imagine Wellingtonians are very much different from the rest of New Zealand in that respect. This, I can't see any reason why the design of the street furniture in Greytown or the details of the community centre in Cannons Creek need to be decided by a regional entity on that table. It would be neither democratic nor efficient, and it does not fulfil the criteria um, for subsidiarity, decisions being made as close as possible to those affected. We've given the Select Committee some options about how they might address this issue and rather hope that they will listen because if there is no change in this area, area I fear all of the other provisions uh, will be less effective. Moving on, the next government initiative is the Local Government Efficiency Task Force, which has already been mentioned this morning. This comprises eight people, seven of whom are current or former local government inhabitants, and it's chaired by a lawyer. The task force will report on how local government consultation, planning and financial reporting could be more effective and is also going to look at the vexed issue of development contributions. These are all areas of great concern for local government. The labyrinthine cons consultation procedures we are obliged to undertake have left a high degree of consultation fatigue in the community and in many cases are not providing us with real, any real insight into public opinion. We desperately need a new paradigm of citizen engagement in New Zealand and I hope that the task force is approaching its mandate with this in mind. Another inquiry is being undertaken by the Productivity Commission which is looking at local government regulatory performance. There are detailed terms of reference basically leading to where regulatory power should best sit, central or local government, and identification of opportunities for improvement. In this case, I think there is a gap in the terms of reference which talk about the balance between local and central government but completely ignore the issues that are seen every day in the context of regional versus territorial authorities, in particular under the RMA. However, I'm sure that the Commission will have this challenging area drawn to its attention. The results of these two inquiries will, as I said earlier, need to be integrated with the other changes the government is pursuing and I assume will be part of another reform bill that's been signalled for early next year. The government has also announced it will be setting up a task force of some sort to investigate the efficiency of local government infrastructure provision, but terms of reference and membership haven't been announced. Given that infrastructure of one, uh, is one of local government's primary responsibilities, it will be an important piece of work. These initiatives constitute a massive program of work, but wait, there's more. There is major work going on around the Resource Management Act, far too detailed to go into this morning. A couple of years ago we had one amendment to the RMA and then now the so-called Phase 2 reforms are being shaped and or delivered. They're aimed at providing greater central government direction and closer alignment of legislation and touch on numerous other areas and pieces of legislation including Aquaculture, the Building Act, the Conservation Act, the Forest Act, Historic Places Act, the Public Work Act and a several pronged programme on water management in addition to some of the core principles of the RMA. It is huge. A technical advisory group has made examples about sections 6 and 7 of the RMA which if enacted could have major cost implications for councils requiring the rewriting of existing policy statements and plans without the benefit of existing practice and case law to confine the extent of relitigation. And um, believe me, I think it is appeals to the Environment Court and litigation that actually delays um, in, um, infra uh, sorry, the introduction of plans rather than local government bureaucracy. The TAG report also recommended a new separate combined regional and district natural hazards plan which would be difficult under existing governance arrangements and I won't go into that in detail. Many of us share concerns about the lack of integration of district and regional planning provisions within the present local government um, structural arrangements and as I said earlier, this could theoretically uh, be, be addressed by these streams of work that are going on. 
The concept of spatial planning as a mechanism for engagement with central government aims and for improved integration of planning, especially in the urban environment. But if it's to be successful in providing consistency within regions and certainty for communities, the RMA will need to be changed and need, needs to be increased linkages um, between the various other acts. Spatial planning would need to be facilitated as an instrument in the Local Government Act with links to other legislation as well. The changes proposed um, in, some of, in that uh, technical advisory group report don't provide for or resolve those issues. So again, it's going to be important uh, that the government link up these findings with the others. They're go going to have to think laterally and see what comes out of the Productivity Commission, see what comes out of the Task Force on, on Efficiency. Uh, have a look at that in the light of um, whatever comes out of the Infrastructure Group and also then link up these RMA proposals. In the area of water management, now cutting edge in terms of environmental, environmental issues for New Zealand, more emphasis is being placed on regional councils running what are described as collaborative processes with their communities. The NPS on fresh water requires limits to be set and is technically and politically challenging. Scientific resources of councils will be stretched as will their capacity for facilitating a new type of community engagement. This, this, I'm talking about regional councils here. This could be an exciting and productive time, but it could also be a complete disaster, and it will be important for the government to work with councils who are already becoming piggy in the middle between farmers and increasingly environmentally conscious communities. In particular, the concept of catchment-based approaches will bring about the involvement of local people making decisions about their areas on top of national or regional baselines. The government is also moving in a number, number of other areas. One I haven't mentioned is transport with changes to planning and public transport contracting currently before Parliament. Some of the planning changes will potentially streamline activities, however others may take the local government sector back to short-term transport planning. In regions where transport networks are complex, and we're certainly one of them, this will not assist effective planning for improvements that take many years to implement. Uh, public transport and major roading projects in particular. I also have some concern uh, that the new approach may hinder integrated planning in the absence of effective spatial planning outside of Auckland. Uh, one of the key areas that runs through the, all the discussion is the need for scale in many areas. Uh, Mike talked in some detail about scale and the what I consider the quantity issue. Larger councils spend relatively the same per capita regardless of size, he said. But scale gives other benefits, which I believe are more powerful reasons for considering some local government reform. The rational apportionment of funding and resources access to schools and expertise, strategic and spatial planning, and importantly, as we have seen in Auckland, and Doug may not agree with this, but it seems that way to the rest of us, the ability to exert um, influence back onto central government, or at least have an engagement with central government, which much of local government does not have. These are all critical, and the benefits of scale in these areas cannot be underestimated. The other key theme that's coming through in a lot of areas is quite the opposite of that. It's about citizen action, community decision making, responsiveness to local demands. Um, as I said, um, this is coming through very strongly in the discussion here in Wellington and I know was a um, concern with the Auckland changes. The challenge for the government and for local government is resolving the apparent contradictions between these themes. Despite all the doom and gloom I've presented this morning, I'm by nature a pretty much a, half, a glass half full sort of person, and I think it's not beyond the wit and cent of so central and local government working together to arrive at solutions. We need appropriate and flexible approaches that as far as possible are future-proofed and won't need to be revisited in just a few years' time. That's really important. It's actually quite tiring to think about all these things going at what, on at once in the local government sector, but it's even worse thinking of the consequences if we don't get it right. Thank you.